Hey, what's up you guys? I'm Sarah Labratt and I took Neil Gaiman's masterclass on the art of storytelling. So today we're going to be talking about what I learned. So if you go on to enjoy this video, I would really appreciate it if you could give it a big thumbs up. And now without further ado, let's jump straight into talking about what I learned from taking Neil Gaiman's masterclass on the art of storytelling. Neil Gaiman's class was about four hours long, I believe, but I did end up having to watch most of it on 1.5 speed, similar to what I needed to do to finish Margaret Atwood's class. Just because of how they speak and how slowly they speak and how many pauses they use and everything, it was just easier for me to watch it on 1.5 speed. So with that note being said, let's talk about his lesson, Truth in Fiction. I realized that in order to write fiction, I needed to be honest. Up until that point, I had a, I had a facility with voices. I could do essentially impressions of other writers. I could write things that felt kind of like things that other writers would have written and written well, but I didn't have anything to say. And that wasn't because I hadn't lived. That was because I wasn't really prepared to say anything true about who I was. I thought that this was an interesting way for Neil Gaiman to start out his class by talking about truth in fiction and how important the truth is. And when he's talking about this, he means the truths and realities of our world, even though it might be in a fantasy setting or in a different, not real world setting because it is in a book. But he puts a lot of stress on the importance of putting truth into the stories that you write. And until you do that, you are pretty much imitating other authors and you can imitate an author just fine. It's good practice. But until you are ready to actually say something and actually include a lot of truth in your work, your stories will not necessarily show a lot of you as the writer in them. Writing yourself and going back to your own past and visiting your own past. As a writer, you're not writing autobiography. What you're doing is lying, but you're using the truth in order to make your lies convincing and true. You're using them as seasoning. You're using the truth as a condiment to make an otherwise unconvincing narrative absolutely credible. It is, it is vitally important that whatever engines you might have used to convince your teacher that your homework really was eaten by the dog now come out. And if you're specific, then what you say that's true applies to other people too. But you have to be willing to just open your chest a little bit too much and show rather more than is comfortable of your heart and of your mind. By including truths about the world into your stories, it is so much easier for a reader to connect with those stories because they can recognize things that they have potentially similarly felt. Because while the human experience is very unique to each of us, there are very common things that happen. And even if it's not super, super common, someone might be able to draw back on an experience that they went through that was similar enough to something that you're writing about and the emotions that the characters are feeling in order to evoke something in the reader where they feel incredibly connected to the story. The next lesson was all on sources of inspiration and I was fascinated by the fact that Neil Gaiman decided or maybe Masterclass decided but whoever came up with this lesson idea to do an entire lesson on sources of inspiration I thought was a really fascinating choice and some of my key takeaways from this lesson was that Neil Gaiman recommends a compost heap but this is not really one that you can actively develop. You can actively develop it but you might not be conscious of the fact that you're developing it and that's okay. But he makes a comment about the ideas that you have and the people that you meet and everything that you will experience will join this compost heap and out of them you will grow beautiful stories because of all of the experiences that you've had being a human. Those things will help develop your stories even if it's not active. He also says that your influences are not necessarily what you think they are because it's not just other writers or books. It's often the people that you've met or the music that you've listened to or the places that you've visited and all of those things coming together in that compost heap to then grow really beautiful stories out of them because of the experiences that you have had in the past. Remember that your influences are all sorts of things and some of them are going to take you by surprise. But the most important thing that you can do is open yourself 
to everything. One of the things that's really fun as a writer is subverting expectations. And one of the places as a young writer, and frankly, as an old writer, as a crusty, grumpy, aging writer, um, that's great to do, is to take apart a story that you're familiar with and inspect it new. See how it ticks, see what makes it work. Look at the things that um, people take for granted. A lot of the time, if you look at something that you're very, very familiar with, but just look at it as if it's the first time, turn it round, examine it from odd angles, suddenly it can open up into a story. This idea of taking a very familiar story or story type and examining it in a different way is one of the examples that Neil Gaiman uses in coming up with new ideas for stories and coming up with new stories. It's a very fun idea and I might need to attempt something like this, but I love this idea of looking at something that's classic and something that's well known and re-examining it to see what spin you could put on it if you were just to look at it in a different light. Another idea that he suggests is going to a public place and imagining stories about the people around you, listening to the people around you, and imagining what would happen if you were in a space and something happened and how those other people you were with would react to said thing. And just using this as an idea starter to try and spark something that you could potentially turn into something larger. I have talked about this a couple of times here on my channel before, but my initial idea that I had for the book that I'm currently working on, which is Project DE, which is a high fantasy told from three points of view, was actually a work of art on Pinterest. And I don't think I've been able to find the original in a long time. I think I got taken down, but that was the initial idea that I had for this story, which kind of both devolved and evolved into the story that it is now. Like that idea slowly got broken down as my brain was working away at it for a really, really long time. And then slowly a story began to be built on top of that idea that went on my compost heap. And slowly figuring these things out and figuring out how actually reading those books and seeing that Pinterest picture have affected my book that I'm writing today. You asked the real question, where do you get your ideas, is a real question. I said you get ideas from two things coming together. You get ideas from things that you have seen and thought and known about, and then something else that you've seen and thought and known about, and the realization that you can just collide those things. And a lot of that, right in the beginning, can just be boredom. It can be looking out of a window. It can be, I love um, going to junior school and middle school kids drama. Um, you cannot escape, you are stuck there. You can't take out your phone, you can't read, you have to watch. And yet the need to be elsewhere is such that you know you can absolutely go off and come up with some fantastic ideas for things. I thought this part was so funny when I first watched it because he forces himself into a situation where he cannot check his phone or computer. It doesn't matter that he doesn't have Wi-Fi or can be on the internet. I'm not even sure if that's something that he struggles with, but I'm going to make assumptions as a writer myself. But the fact that he goes and sits in these plays and dramas just because he can't do anything else and because they're, you know, not good enough to watch necessarily, especially if you don't have like a child in it, that your brain has to go somewhere else and then starts working on a story or starts working on something else because it has to, because it is that bored is such a funny idea and I totally want to try this now. I don't know what schools would be having plays anytime soon, but I might have to look for one because I really, really want to try this now. When you're a writer starting out, the idea of your voice, of your style, is huge. Um, you want to know what your voice is, you don't really know. I once, years ago, ran into a quote from Jerry Garcia, where he said, style is the stuff that you get wrong. If you were actually playing the guitar perfectly, um, if you were making music perfectly, there would be no style. And I thought this was such a great quote and remembered it. And years later, went to find it on the internet. And the only place I could ever find it was me saying it in interviews. So maybe he never said it at all. Um, but I do think that a writer's voice 
which is huge, which is important, which is actually the thing that the reader responds to more than anything else. The end of the day is a result of getting to the point where you discover this is what you sound like. And the problem I think that a lot of young writers have is they don't sound like anybody yet. If you were playing the guitar perfectly, there would be no style. I love that. <laughs> I don't really know what else to say about it, but it's fascinating that he's able to put it in such a way that it really feels like style is something to be explored and that style really does come from the differences rather than sounding the same. And what Neil Gaiman suggests for newer writers starting out is to imitate other people just to learn their styles and what you like and what you don't like to eventually help develop your own style. I think mistakes may be the most important thing for a writer. The question of how do you find your mistakes is very easy. You do stuff. The process of living, the process of trying to create, the process of getting out there and doing something is always a process in which you are going to screw up. You are going to break things. You are going to try things that do not work. That's huge. Chuck Jones said, you have a million bad drawings in your pencil and your job as an artist is to get them out so the good ones can follow. And I think as a writer, and especially as a young writer, your job is to get the bad words out, the bad sentences out, the, the stories that aren't any good yet. And you don't ever get them out going, I'm gonna write a really bad story now. I, I just have to get this out. You think it's a great story. You think it's a great idea. You think it's good at least, but the most important, and it may be, but the most important thing is just you get it out. Neil Gaiman basically said, if you want to be a better writer, you have to write. Seems simple, seems very simple, but that's the only way to figure out what works and what doesn't and to get the bad ideas out so that eventually you can come across writing a really, really good idea that can go somewhere eventually. Everything that you do as a young writer is going to be important in getting your voice. But the most important thing is just writing. The most important thing that will teach you who you are is you write and you finish things if you can. Write things and finish them. Brandon Sanderson says the same thing. As soon as you start writing, you're never gonna get anywhere unless you start finishing things. A story may not be the right idea for you at that current moment. You can put it aside, but unless you start finishing things, you can't really move forward in your career as a writer. In the publishing sense, and in the sense of like other people actually reading your work, which might not be your goal, but if it is, and even if it's not, finishing things shows yourself that you can. And so then when it's important for you to finish something, you can. You learn more from finishing a failure than you do from writing a success. And you definitely learn more from finishing a failure than you ever do from beginning something that is fantastic but stops. Beginning writers often don't know and can't tell if they have a story. They know that they've got an idea, but even once you've got an idea, what do you do with it? How do you build it up? How do you know if your idea has legs, if it's gonna go anywhere? We're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about how you build a short story, how you build a novel, how you build a plot, how you find out if you have an idea or a notion or a concept or something that actually might be able to stand up there on its own two legs as a novel. At the beginning of the lesson called Developing a Story, they show the place where Neil Gaiman writes, and I actually reacted to his writing space when I made a video called Reacting to Famous Authors' Writing Spaces, I believe is what it was called. And his was by far my favorite one that I reacted to because it was a place that I could see myself writing. This isn't super related to the masterclass, but because they showed it, I felt the need to mention it because I love his writing space. What is a story? And eventually, what I decided was the story is anything fictional that keeps you turning the pages and doesn't leave you feeling cheated at the end. When I took Brandon Sanderson's creative writing class, he said something very similar, but that a book needed to have a really satisfying ending, even if it was not the ending that the entire story was obviously being built towards. As long as it feels satisfying, you've succeeded. The what's gonna happen game 
is the game that you play as a writer with your readers? What's going to happen? And that is what keeps them turning the pages. Things they don't know, things they need to find out, things they care about. And coming into a story, it can just be things like, who are these people? What are they doing? Why should I care? That's a bit odd. After a while, it can get a lot deeper. Anything you can do to keep people turning the pages is legitimate. The main thing that you have to do is to care. Because if you don't care what happened, nobody else will. You need to care because if you don't care, no one else is gonna care. And you constantly want your readers to be asking, and then what happened? Because and then what happened is what keeps people turning the pages. In this same lesson on developing the story, he then moves into writing down everything that you know. You are starting a project. You are starting from scratch. Whether it's a comic, a graphic novel, whether it's a novel, whether it's a short story, whether it's television, whether it's a movie script, you're starting something completely new. One of the best things that you can do is just sit there. I like to do it by hand if I can. I will take out a notebook and I will write down everything I know. And it's a giant brain dump. Um, Sometimes there'll be little doodles. Words will get circled. This is not an essay for people to read. This is me telling myself right up front just everything I know. The process of writing is a really important one because even in the process of writing anything simple, your mind starts to notice connections. And connections are what fiction is made out of. I don't write everything I know down by hand, but I do use a document that I personally call my spare ideas document to keep all of your ideas like somewhat organized or at least all in the same place before you start writing a story and as you're writing the story. So that as you continue to have ideas, you can add it to this document. And then when you need to like look for an idea that you remember having, you can go back to this document and pull it out. But these documents, I have one for each of my stories. These documents have saved me so many times. And if you don't have one, I would strongly recommend starting a brain dump document where you just put every idea that you've had for a certain story. And I think faith in yourself is something that you need because the process of writing, it's Wile e. Coyote running along a cliff and then still running. And he's fine until he stops and looks down. So as a writer, part of your job is not to stop and look down and go, there is nothing underneath me because then you will fall. It's, it's a process of just continuing to run young writers because young writers are peaceable souls, because young writers want to live in a happy place, because young writers have had enough conflict in their lives already, tend to shy away from conflict. And you will read short stories by them um, and you'll go, but but there, that's the place where your two characters are meant to bounce and meant to collide. This is where the plot is meant to get tough. This is where things are meant to get difficult for people, but they'll avoid it. And making young writers face conflict, making them write conflict, making them realize that there are so many different ways you can solve problems of conflict, but you have to have the conflict. Young writers tend to shy away from conflict. I know that I definitely did when I started writing. I am still trying to get better at this. And then Neil starts talking about what you should do when you get stuck with writing. And he says that you should always return to what your characters want because your characters wants should be what's driving the story. Just have two of your best characters and have them figure out what they want and have them want things that are mutually exclusive and then set them off. And you know that only one of them can have the thing, whatever the thing that they want is. If they succeed, the other one fails and vice versa. And now let's get them going. 
that's got to give you conflict. It's got to give you a plot. And sometimes the what does a character want will surprise you. You know, it's not just they want the money. They want the boy. A lot of the time it's they want to learn. They want to grow up. They want to save their friend. And, and so it's, what do you want? What do you need? And that, as a driver, is always one stage below the mechanics of plotting. And it will save your ass over and over as a writer. Characters always, for good or for evil, get what they need. They do not get what they want. These two things are also talked about by Brandon Sanderson in his creative writing class. The mutually exclusive wants. And what makes interesting stories is the character learning in the story that what they want is not necessarily what they need and they end up getting what they need and not necessarily what they wanted. Just thought I would point this out because if two really, really successful authors both mention this in their creative writing classes, there's probably some truth to it. The lesson that follows this one is a short story case study. And while I didn't choose to pull any clips from this lesson, I did note that stories are driven by wants and often opposing wants and needs propel the story and guide it. And then that moves us on to short fiction. And then he said, you know, really? He said, all, all my best short stories are the last chapter of a novel I didn't write. And I loved that. I really took that to heart. Because when you're writing short fiction, what you want, whether it's true or not, is to feel like these characters didn't just start to exist the moment the story began. You wanna know they've all been in existence all along. Short stories, according to Neil Gaiman, are about compression. You still want to evoke feeling, you still want your characters to feel real, you just want it to happen in a much smaller span of time than it would have in a full length novel or something longer. A lot of writers, when they think that they want to set out and sail their first craft out under the seas of story, immediately get the idea that you should go huge. You should write a series of 10 books and have a huge mega plot and you should have a cast of thousands and all of these things. And there's a lot of skills that you need to do that and to do it successfully. Even those writers who have done that have tended to have to learn their craft as they go, book by book in progression. What's lovely is taking short journeys, is taking your boat out and just going round the headland and coming back in time for tea. So. A short story is lovely. You can do that in a day or a weekend or a week or two weeks. I did feel a little called out during this part because the first two books that I wrote, I have technically started writing five, but the first two books that I wrote, the first one I decided was going to be the first in a four book series. And then the second book that I wrote, I decided after writing like 216,000 words for it, I decided that it was too long to be one book and then it would perform better as a trilogy. And for that second book, I still definitely believe that to be true. But for that first book, I don't know what would happen in books two, three, and four. This is also a book that has not made it past like the third revision, but that I do want to reread soon just because I think that that would be a really interesting journey for me to like read through and look back on and see how far I've come as a writer. But I felt called out. <laughs> then Neil Gaiman goes into another short fiction case study on one of the short stories that he's written. And in this one, he basically says that to write something longer, you can start with a short story and then just expand the narrative into something larger. And then we move on to his lesson on dialogue and character. So people talk when writing fiction about character, and they talk about dialogue, and they talk about them as if they're two different things. And they are two different things, but they're two different things that actually amount to the same thing. And they're like the, the two legs the character needs in order to walk. So in the next class, we're gonna talk about character and dialogue and what they are and how incredibly tightly interwoven they can be. Dialogue has to 
show character. It also has to show plot. And maybe it can be funny along the way. And good dialogue is doing all three of those things at the same time. And more than anything, it's telling you things about the people who are saying it. I'd learned how to compress and I'd learned how to show character, show who somebody was by what they said. Neil Gaiman really emphasizes that you need to listen to your characters, especially if they feel forced or like something isn't right, because it probably isn't. Dialogue either needs to show characterization or plot movement, and ideally both. Again, this is something that Brandon Sanderson also talks about in his creative writing class, that the whole point of dialogue is to move things forward, and if it doesn't matter to characterization or plot, it might not matter to have in the story. If you were a starting out writer, probably even if you're an experienced writer, I have two pieces of advice for you. If you want to, to channel a character, a time period, anything, one of which is, and, and they're kind of opposite and contradictory and they're both true. One of which is, trust yourself. Do it. You do it by doing it, just do it. And the other is, do your research. But I've known too many writers starting out who would get trapped in a vortex of research. Um, and you can't. You have to do enough research. It's, it's like you're a, a smash and grab robber. You are going to put that brick through the window, then you're going to reach in and grab everything that you need and run away and use it. Because honestly, you don't want to spend uh, 10 years researching. When you have a lot of characters, or even just some characters, you will occasionally need to remind your characters of who those people are. And Neil Gaiman uses a technique that he likes to call funny hats. And this technique is basically giving each character something that will distinguish them enough from the other characters that it will help remind the reader who which character is. It's something where it's enough to delineate characters from one another, but not too much to weigh down the story. So you take these characters and secure in the novel Knowledge that none of them could be confused for any of the others. None of them talk the same. And when they turn up, um, you know who they are. The reader does not have to work at that thing. It's a different day. The lighting is worse. Are we surprised? Not really. This video is taking me too long to film yesterday, so I kind of gave up on it, and now we're on today. So, I think that's too distracting. What vibe do we want? We'll go with orange for right now. These masterclass videos take me a really long time to both learn all of the information and then film. And so if you haven't already, I would really appreciate it if you could give it a big thumbs up because like I said, these take a very long time. So with that, and I apologize for the scene shift and everything, but the sun has long since gone down. So we are going to launch back in to Neil Gaiman's masterclass on the lesson of world building. Neil Gaiman kicks off this world building lesson by bringing up the idea of the compost heap again because you can smuggle in details from your life, the people you've met, and the places that you've been to all create a more realistic world. And then he goes into once again saying that you need to believe in your world and you need to believe in your settings and what's going on. Because once again, if you don't care about your story, no one else will either. But more importantly, if you don't believe in your story, you're not going to put forth the amount of effort that is needed to get someone else to also care about it. I just realized that my plants aren't up and I think that makes it look more boring, so hang on. Yes, that's better. There's always a tiny part of you as a writer who metaphorically or really is standing there with a notebook. And these moments of realism and credibility and truth that come from your own experiences that you've had, whether for better or for worse, ultimately just serve you in the world building of creating future stories. Neil Gaiman also brings up the idea of the iceberg method without actually calling it the iceberg method. He basically says that there will be questions that you will start asking yourself about your world and about world building that will likely not make it into the actual story, but as its creator, it's important that you know what's going on. And I feel 
feel like this has been talked about in every single masterclass that I've taken so far, but the whole idea of the iceberg method is that only about 10% of the iceberg is actually above the water. That's all of the information that is in the book. And the other 90% is the rest of the world building that you did to make the world feel real to you in order to communicate it well on the page. You need to understand, especially if you're creating anything in the world of the fantastic, what the rules of your world are. The problem with this is that when we arrive in this world, nobody tells us what the rules are. Nobody hands you as a small child a rule book, letting you know how gravity works, how fire works, how basic economics works. You need to treat them as you would this world. People find things out by making mistakes. You find out that fire is hot by picking up something that's been in the fire or putting your hand in it and going out. Let things happen to your characters. Let them go out and bump into things. Let them go out and make mistakes and always know more than you tell. You know, there is nothing more frustrating for an author to have people go, oh, I don't really understand the rules of this place. And because it's fine. Nobody understands the rules of New York either but they will find out what some of the rules are by making mistakes and some of the rules by hanging around with people who seem to have figured out what a few of the rules of New York are, and that's okay. I love this idea of there being rules to a story and not having to explain all of them because like Neil Gaiman says, no one really understands every single rule about being in New York, but the characters will find out some of the rules about your world through making mistakes and through hanging out with people that have kind of figured out what some of the rules actually are. Use a, a tiny notebook. I always, wherever I go and whatever I do, tiny notebooks on me, I will always, jot down things, little ideas. I may never go back to them. I may never see them again. But once they're jotted down, they're rotting away usefully on the compost heap of my imagination. And they're there if I need them. It's come in full circle with the compost heap and that extra ideas notebook or document where you write down every single one of your ideas for everything or for just a single story. I do not hold with anybody who says no exposition, no description. You describe what needs to be described. You explain what needs to be explained. You are God. When you are writing, you are absolutely in charge. You can do whatever you like. There are no rules other than tell a great story, tell it as best you can. But there is an enormous pleasure to just telling. There's no reason to show, don't tell, whatever that actually means. When you want to tell somebody what a city looks like, tell them, why show it? Why not just tell? It's a lovely scene setting and it sets up a place in which the story is going to occur. Out of all the creative writing classes I've taken, both in real life and college and through Masterclass and YouTube, Neil Gaiman is the first author that I've ever heard kind of fight back on the show don't tell thing. And he says that it is perfectly fine to tell things when that's what feels right to you. Which I think is interesting because in the excerpts that he's read for this Masterclass, it seems like he is showing a lot more than he's telling. And when he does choose to tell instead of show, it's in very small snippets that just very easily sum things up. And I think he's really perfected the art of it. And I think it's fascinating that he says this and I need to start looking at this in my own writing to see where I do actually need to show and where it would be okay to just sum things up very, very shortly with telling. For description, what I try and do is I will scene set, I'll set a scene for people. I'll describe a person, I'll describe a gate, I'll describe a grave. But what I will do is assume that people generally know what a tree looks like, what a house looks like, what a door looks like. So what I'll try and tell them is what makes this a little different, what makes this memorable. And that's the other lovely thing that you can do if you can with description is do more than one thing at the same time. I thought that this was a really interesting way for him to put it, that he would rather write down one memorable detail about how something is different rather than just 
describing whatever it is and basically using the human experience and what people kind of automatically assume things to look like and to seem like and twist it just a little bit so that it still plays to those similarities but in a way that it doesn't bog down the story with unnecessary detail. And then when Neil Gaiman says that it's best when description can do more than one thing at one time, I believe is also something that Brandon Sanderson talked about in his creative writing class. And it's still just really interesting to look at the parallels between these two classes because out of the master classes and creative writing classes that I've taken thus far, I do think that some of the principles that Neil Gaiman and Brandon Sanderson have are the most similar to one another than any of the other classes I've taken thus far. Before you can be eccentric, you have to know where the circle is. And I took that as glorious advice that has always seen me safe. It's always good to know what the rules are before you break them. Know safely what the rules are and then break them with joy. You have to learn the rules first before you can break them. This is uh, the first of the absolute Sandman volumes. It is huge it is very heavy you could use it to stun a burglar if necessary which has always been my definition of art i had to include that part because i thought it was absolutely hysterical and then neil gaiman moves into talking about dealing with writer's block a topic that many of us know very well people love to talk about writer's block and they love to talk about writer's block because it sounds fancy it sounds like a real thing it also sounds like something that you can do nothing about I have writer's block, I cannot write. And it is the will of the gods. Now I must alphabetize my spice rack. You can't do anything about it. And that of course isn't true. I have received long emails from people with writer's block. And I'm going, well, if you had real writer's block, how can you, how can you be writing me a long email? About, and what they're actually saying is I'm stuck on the thing. I don't know what's happening. It's dead on the page. So what you do is one, Start one step away. First thing to do if you're actually stuck, don't just sit there staring at the page, staring at the screen, staring at your keyboard, being angry. Go do something else. Chop wood. Go for a walk. Go for a run. Go for a swim. Go garden. Go play with small children. Go explore kittens. Go feed the chickens, go do whatever it is that you can do. Two, come back pretending you have never read it before, the old pretend you have never read it before technique. Start at the beginning and read it through. Very, very often, once you do that, where the story should be becomes obvious. Where you went off the rails becomes obvious. And you did go off the rails. The problem is always earlier. Problems always earlier than the place where, you know, the car goes off the road and now you're stuck there. Um, you know, you actually took a wrong turning a couple of streets back or, or a town or two back. But that's something that you can see normally. If you just come to it and go from the beginning and come through, you're suddenly going, oh, well, hang on. Why are we with him anyway? She was much more interesting and, and we should be with her here. It doesn't matter what happens to him. And so I abandon half a chapter that had led me down a dead end and go back. And you can do that. Nobody but you ever gets to read your first draft. Nobody but you ever needs to know that you got stuck. I think that these are two really great reminders. Writer's block, you can work through, but it's either going to take stepping away from the page or going back to an earlier point to try and figure out where the story went wrong and why it's fighting you now. And the other one is that no one ever has to read your first draft and probably no one ever really should, at least not in its entirety. If there are some really fun sections that you wanna to send to someone, absolutely go for it. But in reality, no one's gonna read your full first draft. So you don't need to put a ton of pressure on yourself to make the first draft absolutely perfect because perfectionism kills. Other things that Neil Gaiman suggests with fighting writer's block or a writing block instead of actually technically writer's block is giving yourself a deadline. For some people this works. For me, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Recently, it hasn't worked super, super well, but Neil Gaiman gives an example of how he was given 24 hours to write a story and then he wrote a story in 24 hours. 
NaNoWriMo, which stands for National Novel Writing Month, works rather well for a lot of people. Works really well for some people to get basically the entire rough draft of a story done within 30 days, the 30 days of November. This happens every single year. I have won just one time, but I think I've tried to do NaNoWriMo like three or four times, and then it was just this last year that I won for the first time. So he suggests trying to write on a deadline because there's nothing more helpful than a little stress sometimes. Something else that you can do is writing the next thing you know. I do this and have done this a lot in my writing when pretty much my entire first draft is me writing the scenes that I know and then going back through and connecting them and discovering new things within the connections between the scenes. But giving myself the permission to write non-chronologically has helped me on a variety of projects. Writing a novel, there are things that you know and there are things that you don't know. But a novel is big enough that there are going to be a lot more things that you don't know going into it than things that you do know. Whether or not you write an outline or you don't write an outline, you are still going to be moving from point to point with a lot of things that you don't know happening on the way. E.L. Doctorow said that writing a novel is like driving through the fog with one headlight out. I'm trying to do it just with one headlight. You can't see very far ahead of yourself most of the time. And you're creeping along fairly slowly. But you could get from New York to Los Angeles like that. You just have to keep going. It's about forward motion. It's about going from the things you know to the things you know, walking slowly. And every now and again, the mists will clear and you'll get a wonderful view of the valley on the other side of the town that you're heading towards. You know what's happening and then the mists will come back in again. And once more, you're creeping along. But that's how you write a novel. Well, that's how I write novels. To be an artist, and particularly to be a writer, what you are doing is a twofold process. And to put it very simply, it's a process of creating and then it's a process of fixing or of editing. The first thing you do as a writer is you explode. You explode like a bomb explodes. You explode onto the page. The story is an explosion and you get to the end of it. And once it's done, then you get to walk around it and you get to look at the shrapnel and the damage it did and you get to see who died, and you get to see how it worked. And that's the point where you get to think about it. You get to think about what works and what doesn't work. So after you've written your first draft or exploded on the page, like Neil Gaiman says, then you get to look back at your story and begin the revision process by looking at all of the pieces that you like and all of the pieces that you want to improve. He recommends letting your story sit for a while. He says a week to 10 days. I know that other people recommend upwards of a month or at least a month before looking back at your story again, just so that you can read it as a reader would instead of as you would as the author. And try and pretend, and pretend like a method actor. Pretend like this is the most important thing in the world to me. Pretend that I've never read it before and I know nothing about it. And then I read it. And it's very easy. It gets easier the longer it goes, I think, for me, just to pretend that I've never, I don't know anything about this thing. I'm reading it as best I can as a reader. And I do it printed out because I have a pen or a pencil with me. And I am not vicious, not cruel, but I'm, a reader and I will make notes in the margin of anything that doesn't work for me as a reader. Some of the time it's things that I thought I could get away with. It needs a battle. And, um, and you try and pretend that you as a writer and you as a reader are two different people because you're going to look at your notes at the end. And that's what is going to really guide you. That is going to be the primary engine through a second draft. 
through an edit, through a fix. I really appreciated that Nail Gaiman decided to do an entire lesson on editing because I am currently working on draft five of my book and I'm currently for draft five rereading what I have for draft four. And I took a bunch of notes on how Brandon Sanderson recommends editing and now I'm taking a bunch of notes on how Neil Gaiman suggests editing. And I really need to practice reading the story as a reader and not so much as the person who created it because that is where I get hung up sometimes and that is definitely hard but it's just a very pleasant reminder to read the story as a reader and Neil Gaiman also says that reading as a reader instead of reading as the writer often means that you're making nicer comments and not being as incredibly nitpicky about the story then you read it you read it pretending you've never read it before you read it with new eyes and one of the questions that you ask yourself when you get to the end is okay what was that about? And that's the most important question that you can ask yourself because the difference between what you're gonna do in the first draft and the second draft can often be tiny, but it's the most important draft is getting to that second draft. And the question, what is this about, is what gets you from the first draft to the second draft because what you're then doing is you're going okay in which case what i have to do now is buttress what the story is about and eliminate those places where i'm writing stuff that isn't what the story is about and it gives you just a wonderful easy yardstick for what stays in and what goes out is just the idea of what is my story about you've, you've now written it what you thought it was about probably isn't what it's about or it's only part of what it's about. I know that Neil Gaiman says first to second draft on this, but for me, I've been learning this as I'm going from my fourth to my fifth draft, as I talked about earlier. And it was really interesting to finally figure out what the story was actually about. And that is going to allow me to make draft five so much better. Instead of just trying to make it a better fantasy book, because that's what I was writing it as, and that's what I was trying to make it really good. But in rereading draft four, I am learning what the story is actually about and what the themes are and the things that I think are so important to the story. And so then in draft five, like Neil Gaiman says, I will be able to go in and basically build those things up to make those themes stronger. It's a very cool realization once you get to it. Perfect does not happen in this universe. Perfect is an ideal. Perfection is the goal. Perfection is the mountain that we are heading towards. It's the gleaming crystal city on the hill to which we aspire. But we also have to know that anything we do is going to contain its share of errors and mistakes. And we cannot be crippled by that. We cannot be afraid of that. If you write something, it can be improved. The problem is, you cannot fix a blank piece of paper. You can fix a short story that doesn't work. You can fix dialogue that isn't quite there. You can fix the beginning of something, but you cannot fix nothingness. So you have to be brave. You have to just start. You have to be willing to let the process carry you through. And you have to be willing for it sometimes to land you on the rocks for it not to work. You can't fix a blank page. I don't think I have that exact quote on this board right now, but I do have the first draft is as bad as the book is ever going to be. And then up in the corner there, this one says, I'm writing a first draft and reminding myself that I'm simply shoveling sand into a box so that later I can build sand castles. Both are basically saying you can't fix a blank page. The story will get better later on. I need to have faith in the process. I do know that if I don't write the story, there is no chance that it's going to be one of the good ones, one of the loved ones, one of the ones that win the awards, one of the ones that becomes famous, one of the ones I can read at a public reading that people will love. If I don't write it, it will never be that thing. And if I obsess and worry about the ones that I write, where I look at it and go, oh, I thought you were going to be better. You were such a lovely idea and you're not really magic then that feels like I'm also closing the doors 
on the ones where I go, I had no idea you were gonna be so beautiful. This point might have been my favorite of all of the things that Neil Gaiman said in his masterclass, just because it's so true and I don't think we talk about that enough. If you don't make the thing, the thing will never have a chance to be good. And if you don't make the thing, you don't give it the chance to be good and then potentially to be found and discovered by a bunch of people and then adored. And until you give it that really honest, fair shot, you don't know if it's gonna be really, really good or really not great. But I just love that he chose to include this because I really do think that that was one of my favorite lines from this series. Also, what great inspiration to keep writing if Neil Gaiman is telling you that like, it could be something fantastic and widely adored or even adored by a really small group of people, but absolutely loved, but you have to actually write the thing in order to give it that fair shot. I remember reading an essay by Harlan Ellison in which he pointed to an essay by Robert Heinlein and they suggested rules for writers and the rules were how to get published. And I read them and I believed them and I have applied them and they have worked for me. Rule one, you have to write. If you don't write, nothing will happen. Rule two, you have to finish what you write. If you start it and abandon it, or if you start it and never let it go. You know, I know people who just really want to make something perfect, so they never finish, they never let it go. You have to finish. Rule three, having finished it, you have to send it out into the world to somebody who could publish it. These days of internet, that actually broadens your scope. There are so many websites that actually want fiction, want things, but there are also publishers out there, there are agents, you send it out. And that bit is important. Next rule. Heinlein's was refrain from rewriting except to editorial request. Having sent it out, don't just start it again. Don't keep writing that book, that story over and over again. Harlan Ellison added a little note on that. He said, unless you feel what the editor has requested would compromise the integrity of your story, in which case, don't touch it, defend it also perfectly valid. The next rule is when it comes back, because it will probably come back, you have to send it out again. You can't go, I sent it out to this editor, to this publisher, to this agent, it has come back. My heart is broken. I will never write it again, I will put it away. Instead, you have to send it out somewhere out there there is somebody so drunk, so desperate, so confused that they will buy it and they will publish it. And so you're trying to reach that person or perhaps somebody with good enough taste and somebody smart enough, whoever it is, keep going, keep sending it out until you reach that person. And the other rule, which is mine, it wasn't Heinlein's and it wasn't Harlan's, is, and then start the next thing through this all start the next thing. When you finish that first thing and you start the process of sending it out, begin writing the next thing because that's the important thing. Apart from anything else, when that publisher comes to you and says, we love this novel, but we'd love, what's the sequel like? You can say, yes, here is the sequel. I finished that too. And get them even more excited. You need to be writing the next thing. You don't just write something and send it out and then wait for fame and fortune to come knocking on your door. You keep going, you keep writing, you keep finishing things, and now you have more things to send out into the world. I find these rules strangely inspiring. You gotta start stuff, you gotta finish stuff. If you wanna be published, you have to share it with somebody who can publish it. When you get rejected, you have to send it out again to another round of people. And when you are sending out and working on getting that story out into the world, you have to be working on other stuff. Weirdly inspirational. I don't know if I'm the only one that thinks that based on what he just said, but for some reason, it really, really makes me wanna keep writing. You are always going to be rejected. As a writer, 
you're always going to be rejected. And that's basically healthy. But I think the great thing about being a young writer is that on the one hand, you need the humility enough to know that you don't know yet. And on the other, you need an arrogance that is normally only seen in sort of seven-year-old boys. You need that conviction that you are brilliant, that this is brilliant, that this is the greatest idea that anybody's ever had, and that by writing it, you will set the world on fire. Because that is the thing, that is the engine that is going to get you through the stuff that actually needs to be written. Um, you need to think you're brilliant. It's okay that you're not. It's like getting people, people ask me, how do you cope with rejection? How do you cope with writing a short story, writing a novel and giving it to somebody and having it rejected? And there are only two ways to do it. Uh, one of which is you go down, you get sad, you put the thing away, you stop writing, you go and get a real job, go and do something else. And the other is a kind of crazed attitude that actually the most important thing now is to write something so brilliant, so powerful, so good, nobody could ever reject it. Shocker, that idea is back once again. You have to believe in yourself, or as Neil Gaiman says, you have to believe you're brilliant, even if you're not, and that's okay if you're not. I really think he's just trying to drive home this idea that you need to believe in yourself and you need to believe in your story in order to make anything happen. Because if you don't believe in it, you're not gonna finish it. And so I guess believe in yourself, start stuff, finish stuff, and then just keep writing. Again, it seems so simple. <laughs> and yet but rejection either way is healthy if you are a young writer if you and, and by young again i mean you're starting out it's okay to get rejected um the phrase not quite right for us is a really good one because it's true if you give some you write something and it's not quite right for somebody that's what they'll say it's okay, it's just rejection. The trick is, go on, write the next thing. Write the next thing. Write the next thing. It's okay, it's just rejection. Again, it feels weirdly super, super comforting and super encouraging. It's just rejection. Keep writing, keep sending it out. Eventually, if it's the right story to be published, someone who wants to publish it will. Again, so simple but like so comforting. And I don't know if this is just where I'm at right now or if this is like a universally comforting thing, but it's just so cool how he just normalizes rejection. He's like, yeah, it happens. It's just rejection. Just because someone says that it's not right for them probably means that it's just not right for them. Again, weirdly comforting. It makes me wanna go back to writing like right now, like right now, but I have to finish filming this video. So you've just finished the class. Let me give you some advice. The first question that I get asked all the time is, I am an aspiring writer, what should I do? And I give an answer that is meant absolutely seriously, and some people think it's flippant, it isn't. And that answer is, you should write. And some people say, yes, I am already writing. What should I do now? And I say, you should finish things. And some people again, think I'm joking, but some people go, ah, yes, you have a very good point. I should finish things. And they go off and now they continue to write, but they start to finish things. Sometimes people need other kinds of advice. I remember Brian Vaughan, a wonderful writer, did Why the Last Man, many other things. When he was very young, came up to me and he said, what should I do? I want to be a writer and it isn't happening. And I got him to tell me a little bit about why it wasn't happening for him. And what became apparent from what he was saying was he could write, he could finish things, he just didn't have anything to say. And I said, good, so what you should do 
I said, look, normally I would tell people just to write, just to finish things. For you, go out there into the world. Go get a job. Go get fired from a job. Go get your heart broken. See as much of the world as you can. Find things. Bump into things. Get hurt. Come back in a few years' time, and you will have a lot of things to write about. And he did. And when he came back and he told me the story, he said, do you tell that to everybody? And I said, no. I tell it to people every now and again when it seems like that's what they need. But it is a really good thing to remember that experience is good. Reading is fantastic. Read everything you can, write everything you can, but do a lot of living because everything that happens in the living is gonna wind up in the fiction. It's gonna be needed. You are going to need every human being you ever meet. You're gonna need everything that you see because one day you'll write a story and you'll realize that actually you can write this story. My key takeaways from Neil Gaiman's masterclass on the art of storytelling were just summed up in that last portion of what I just showed you guys. It's literally write things, finish things, send them out, keep writing and have experiences if you don't feel like you have anything to say. And even when you do feel like you have something to say, continue to experience things. I believe that this is something that Brandon Sanderson also talked about was having experiences. And this is also something that Sarah J Mass talks about in her interviews is just have experiences because you have to have things to write about. And if you don't experience anything, you're not going to have anything to write about. And I know that those seem like such simple takeaways, but for me, that's what I needed to hear right now was write, keep writing, finish things, and then keep writing afterwards, send them out to people, and then also just live your life and have experiences because those experiences will eventually benefit later stories, or at least have a very high likelihood of potentially impacting and influencing and basically being researched for future stories. I would love to know down in the comments below what your major takeaways from this video were. If you haven't already, I would really appreciate it if you could give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you have not already. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you guys in the next next video. Bye!